Well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Great to see so many of you and your interest in this uh, very timely topic this evening. Um, we, uh, we are going to be talking about, or Judy's going to be talking about um, the Ontario Fire College then and now. Um, very excited to have Judy on board with this um, tonight because uh, it certainly is something we actually, uh, as a library, we haven't done this before. We haven't done anything quite like this. Um, so just so you know. Um, so Judy's our local ar archivist here, um, Judy Humphreys. And uh, yeah, so she's gonna be giving that talk. Um, but before she gets started, I have a few things that I need to do. Um, I, uh, my name is Julia Reinhardt and I'm the CEO Chief Librarian here at the Gravenhurst Public Library. Um, and we are so pleased to be hosting this event. Um, please bear with us if uh, we encounter any technical glitches. Uh, this is, like I said, new for us. Our technology expert, Megan Davidson, is working in the background to address these for us if anything does come up. Um, I, I want to, before we get started, I want to read our land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge that the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Métis people were and are still the keepers and caretakers of the land and waters upon which the town of Gravenhurst now sits, which is covered by the Williams Treaty and the One Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We are deeply grateful for the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples who have helped to shape and strengthen this community for the benefit of future generations. And we are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect. So, um, as I said, we do have quite the large audience this evening and we have, um, as a result, muted all participants. Um, if you do experience any network issues, uh, we suggest that you also turn off your video um, as it does take up a, a much more, a much less bandwidth that way. So, um, as there will be a bit of time for Judy to answer questions at the end of this presentation, we are asking people um, if they have questions to please send those in by chat. It looks like there is a little activity already on the chat. Um, and chat can be found at the bottom of your screen. If you, um, in your Zoom screen there, it, the black bar does come up and it says um, <clears throat> chat. You can click on that. And if you have a question, if you could send it out to um, the entire group, that would be great. Um, there is a good possibility that Judy won't get to all questions this evening. Um, and if that's the case, please feel free to send your questions to Judy uh, directly or to the library. Uh, and we'll make sure those questions get passed on to her. Judy is going to provide her email address at the end of this presentation. Uh, so you'll see that as part of it and you can jot it down. Um, we'll also uh, put it up in the chat too so that, that you can see it at that point. Um, so just so everybody's aware, we are going to be recording this event and we are making it available for viewing on the library's website uh, sometime over the next few days. Uh, now to my introduction of our very own local history extraordinaire, um, Judy Humphreys. Um, Judy was born in London, Ontario, um, but she grew up in many or various small towns before gaining an English degree at Western University and her teaching degree from Queen's University. She came to Gravenhurst High School in 1973 to teach English, but left teaching in 1982 to raise babies. <laughs> when they were old enough to be in school full time, a fantastic opportunity that Judy's gonna talk more about shortly, um, that would lead to a, a new 20 year career came her way. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, her third and present career as a volunteer came with retirement from the work world, managing the Gravenhurst archives. Uh, the history of Gravenhurst is now a full-time, more than full-time, truth be said, I think. <laughs> Judy can attest to that. Um, it became a full-time passionate commitment. And we are certainly glad it did. <laughs> and we are very pleased to have her here with us this evening and thankful 
um, very thankful for the great symbiotic relationship the library has with the Gravenhurst Archives. Um, now over to you, Judy. Thank you, Julia. I'm really pleased that everyone is uh, joining me here this evening. It's lovely to have you all with me. I see some very familiar names as I'm looking down the list of people who have registered. During the next 45 minutes, I would like to take you on a journey, a combination property tour and retrospective of what the Ontario Fire College has been to this province over the last 63 years. As we move through this history, I would ask you to hold your questions until the end, as Julia has already mentioned. But first, a quick further word about my background for conducting this retrospective. After an 11 year career as teaching in uh, uh, Gravenhurst and other cities and towns, um, I spent seven years at home raising a son and daughter to school age. At that moment in time, a moment I can only <laughs> regard as being absolutely one of the most important in my life, I was contacted by the principal of the Ontario Fire College. And I was asked whether I'd be interested in starting or opening a new library for the Ontario Fire College. It would mean, oh, just a few hours a week, a few books, a few fire journals in a small portable recently acquired from the Muskoka um, Regional Centre. And thus began my 20 year career as a fire research librarian, um, the best career I could probably ever have imagined. Uh oh, first glitch. Here we go. So what we're going to be talking about is a fire college that perhaps you had not really ever imagined. Um, and I'm hoping that I will in fact be able to uh, provide you with a sense of, of what the fire college has really been um, to the fire service of Ontario. I'm going to take you back in time, first of all, to the beginning of our story, which is a dirt road to the sanatorium. And I'm going to pause for a minute with a brief warning. Spelling and terminology are constantly evolving in the English language, <laughs> not necessarily for the better, but evolving nonetheless. You will see in here references to a sanitarium or a sanatorium, and that will change over time, um, as you will see in the slides. And while you will see sanitaria on a photo in a moment, in fact, we now speak of sanatoriums. The English teacher and Latin student in me rails at the changes. At one time, we would have spoken of firemen, but now thankfully that has changed to firefighters as more men and women have taken up the, more women, sorry, have taken up the profession. I will use the terms fire officer, captain and company officer interchangeably throughout this talk because really they all mean much the same thing. And as a final warning, the Ontario Fire College was home to me for 20 years. And you will find me wavering from time to time between the past tense and the present tense, and probably using the word we, as I struggle to put the Ontario Fire College firmly into the past. So please bear with me. So let's begin as I always do by setting the stage. This map locates Gravenhurst Tuberculosis Sanatoria. There were four of them, as many of you probably know. I will mention the first one only to remind you of its location at the end of the Muskoka Road or the Sand Road as we've called it here, and of the fact that it sits there empty and desolate. It's underlined on that map. The first was the Muskoka Cottage Sanatorium, truly the first as it was the first sanatorium in Canada for the treatment of tuberculosis. It was built in 1896, it opened in 1897 for patients who could pay. When TB had waned in its prevalence some 60 years later, Muskoka Cottage Sand was sold to become the Muskoka Regional Center, a residential home for the mentally challenged. It would be closed by the government in 1994, and it remains so today. Using that same map, I would like now to introduce you to the Muskoka Free Hospital for Consumptives, built in 1902, and the first free hospital for treatment of TB in the world. It provided treatment to those who could not pay or those who could pay only very little towards their upkeep. It would add a residence and shacks and a farm and many more outbuildings to its original administrative building that's shown on the top left. Note the addition on the extreme left of the uh, picture at the bottom there, a residential building that we will see again shortly. 
This is the sanatorium that is at the heart of our story where it would become the Ontario Fire College. When TB had begun to be conquered, or so we thought, the National Sanatorium Association began to try to sell off some of the sanatorium properties. And one of these was the Muskoka Free Hospital. In another part of Ontario, at another moment in time, a man named William J. Scott, OBE, KC, LLB, was about to make history. He was the fire marshal of Ontario, the second one in our provincial fire service history. And some would say that Fire Marshal Scott had an obsession. Scott had been heavily involved in civil defense during the Second World War. He had been responsible for monitoring civil unrest, possible bomb threats or attacks on installations that were critical to our country in its war effort power plants, aircraft industries, and so on. He was the only Canadian, or for that matter, the only foreigner to have been invited to witness firsthand a nuclear bomb test in the Nevada desert. He had been named Canadian representative to the NATO Civil Defense Committee, which regularly met in post-war England. Following the events of World War II and what he had seen in England, in Canada and in the US of fire and its destruction, he believed that there must be a central fire college for the training and education of fire officers in the province of Ontario. He fought long and hard and finally in 1949, he was able to convince the government of the day that a fire college should be enshrined in legislation. And so it was in the Fire Department's Act of 1949-50. This legislation authorized the building of a central fire college for the training of fire department officers. Let me repeat that again. The training of fire department officers. It also authorized the establishment of regional fire schools for the training of firefighters. Note the distinction that was being made here and the one I'm going to be making throughout, a distinction between fire officers and firefighters. Scott had to wait for seven years to get the funds and the property that he needed for a central fire college. Cities and towns competed for the opportunity to have such a place. But faith stepped in to bring together the fire marshal in want of a property and the Muskoka Free Hospital property in want of an owner. And it was purchased in 1957 by the Ontario government. It opened as the Ontario Fire College on the 22nd of August, 1958. Over 300 dignitaries and citizens attended the opening, coming from across Ontario, across Canada, across North America, and even across the ocean. So let me take you back in time uh, to a moment in 1958. Welcome to the Ontario Fire College of that period. These yellow, yellowing photographs bear testimony to their age. This is actually circa 1958-1960. The driveway shows you a well-forested site, a car of the time facing the brand new entrance sign and no subdivision in sight to the north of the, of the property at all. On the right, there is that fire residence building that we mentioned earlier, which has now been painted and it sits nestled in the trees. It speaks volumes about W.J. Scott, never a patient man, that he opened the first course at the college before the college itself was opened. In October of 1957, 40 fire chiefs from Canada and the US attended a course on the hazards of radioactive materials. Was he prescient? Well, no, but as members of the fire service know all too well today, CBRN responses, that is responses to chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear accidents would become all too plausible and a mainstay of fire department training and emergency planning. Scott could never have imagined that on March 20th, 1995, a domestic terrorism attack in the subway in Tokyo, Japan would unleash sarin gas on unsuspecting passengers, killing 13 and injuring many more. Or he would never have imagined the 9-11 attack in New York City, killing thousands. He couldn't have imagined that on March the 11th, 2011, a major earthquake would unleash a tsunami, which in turn would overwhelm a nuclear plant causing the worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl. What we have learned is that fire departments must respond to all these types of disasters. Earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, wildfires, nuclear accidents, and on and on. 
Our world has become a very complicated place for the fire service and fire officers must plan response and tactics for a wide variety of events. Post War Canada was in many ways a simpler place in a simpler time. Ontario Fire College programs would begin first with courses needed by fire officers in the early 1960s. And these would evolve over time to meet the challenges of an evolving society. Changes in building materials, in industrial processes, in the awareness of devastating impact on fires on schools, on hospitals, boarding houses, hotels, and all would require constant updating of a curriculum so that fire officers could manage new and challenging fire operations. For years, officers would attend the Ontario Fire College from all over the province, absolutely free of charge, with meals, residence, and even transportation paid for by the Office of the Fire Marshal, all to provide for the safety of Ontario citizens. One thing that could not would not change over time is the emphasis on annual seminars for officers at all levels of fire departments. These updating seminars or conferences would last five days and would provide the latest thinking at all levels of fire department operations by speakers brought in from all over North America, and they would continue until COVID-19 stopped them in 2020. When officers came to the Ontario Fire College in those first few decades, they lived in an original sanatorium residence, that one we've been looking at before. It housed 40 men, and I say men with absolute confidence because there were no women in the officer ranks of fire departments then. Accommodations and dining were simple. Notice that the uh, officers are gathered in a very tiny little room there having their, their lunch. I added the little photograph of a radioactive container at the bottom to remind ourselves that Scott and the fire service were becoming well aware of how much more complicated things were going to become. And so this actually was radioactive material, cobalt 60 that was stored at the Ontario Fire College at the time. Frightening to think about. In the mid to the late 1990s, curriculum had evolved to meet the needs of fire departments now engaged in responding to an increasingly complex assortment of events and incidents. Our curriculum had also advanced to meet the needs of the corporate side of fire department management, because running a fire department is running a corporation. The fire college developed new partnerships with colleges and universities to provide courses in management and adult education. The timing of, cor of courses would have to change and evolve too. Officers could not be away from fire departments for three weeks at a time. They could be away at a maximum of two or three days. Thus, much of the coursework was done by officers at their homes or in their departments. They would then come back to the college for intensive training and collaborative assignments and testing before being sent back to their departments to complete post-fire course assignments. Where once a few recruits had been trained in summer at the college, all that had really changed. And almost all recruits were now trained at their departments or at regional schools. On the left, you will see the wide variety of types of company officers or captains, each with overlapping as well as specialized roles, depending upon the size of the fire department. The Ontario Fire College would be responsible for training these various types of officers. Below that list, but still on the left, you will see higher and higher levels or ranks within a fire department. This list shows the complete list of officer levels found in a department like Toronto Fire with its 3,200 employees and its 84 fire stations. Training for these higher officer levels would come with time, experience, acting roles within the department, combined with the annual seminars at the Ontario Fire College. In the middle, you can see a list of the wide variety of incident types that captains or company officers would have to be prepared to manage. On the right, you will see that regional centers provide training at the recruit or probationary level through three levels of intense training. Firefighters were expected to have at least five years and more often more than 10 to at, at all levels of firefighting um, to even think of applying to be a captain. Once a firefighter had the requisite experience, and had demonstrated leadership abilities and initiative, his department could then send him or her to the Ontario Fire College for courses in the company officer program. So now that we've set the stage, let's begin the tour. A tour of a 100 acre property with over 2000 feet 
of frontage on Lake Muskoka. Welcome to an aerial view of the upper third of the Ontario Fire College property. It's truly a beautiful property, well treated and along the water. It has never been available to people for walking as the property has always been off limits to the public without an appointment. Hence, few people will have gone to the places that we're going to go today. In the next photograph, I've named some of the buildings for you. Likewise, from the bottom left, there are three portables. And then moving up above that, you'll see the residence building, the very long white building with the brown roof and the extension behind it, which is where the dining room is. And then a little building in behind there, which is the instructor's house. Then move over to the top right and you will see um, in the background, uh, the, the um, registrar's office building, which was actually, in fact, the uh, principal's residence at one time. You'll see uh, a square with a li library label on it. And then you'll see the fire tech building generally, that whole great big square. And then down to the bottom, we're back at Scott Hall again. We're going to start our tour in the residence building. So let's go through the front doors shown left and we'll stop at security, which is shown in the middle. All people on the property who are not staff must sign in and sign out. And security has always been staffed 24 seven by a firm contracted to provide surveillance. All surveillance cameras on the property are monitored here for trespassers, including the odd moose, uh, a deer, a bear who might wander into the camera's view. The residence building was opened in 1984. There are 100 individual student rooms, common washrooms, a computer lab and quiet study rooms. These building has been, this building has been constantly updated and refurbished throughout its entire history. But in January of 2020, all 100 rooms were again completely refitted with new beds, new desks, drapes, lamps and flooring. Only a few rooms have ever been slept in since as COVID stopped everything in its tracks. It's obvious to me that the move to close the college came as a complete surprise to everyone. Dining room seated 150 people, 100 officers on campus for courses, along with canine or marine unit personnel. And there were other groups offering training at the college too, by the way. The municipal bylaw enforcement officers offered training to their bylaw officers here. Groups working on special projects in both the Solicitor General's Ministry and in the AG's Ministry also worked here at the Ontario Fire College. Initially, all services for fire departments were free. Other groups paid per diem. When the fire college was told that it must recoup some of the cost of fire officer training, we charged $65 a day, sorry, $65 a course per officer student for accommodations and meals. In the photo, you can see that many of the tables and most of the chairs are missing in the dining room. Normally there would have been four chairs at a table. The windows that you see there look out over Lake Muskoka. And if you happen to time your coffee break just right, you could watch the Seguin or the Winona go by on the other side of Henry Island at about 10 o'clock in the morning. Like any college or university, students paid modest student fees. Student fees have always funded the lounge with a bar, a television, games tables, and comfortable areas for conversations. The bar did not open until the classes were closed for the day. Many of you who have lived here in Gravenhurst over the years know that many students had favorite drinking spots in town as well, like the Star Motel, for example, and other places. And those places often have whole walls full of fire department crests. Let's leave the residence building behind now. And briefly, we'll talk about the next building, which is probably a much more important building for, uh, in terms of education. This is the administration office or principal's residence. You're looking at um, three photographs that show you the same building in approximately 1958, 1960 and today. Various principals lived in this house until 1990. It was actually the doctor's residence at one time. The principal also had his administration office on the main floor here. It was deemed advisable that he be on the property 24 seven. And of course it was a prized perk for the principal at the time. 
After 1990, the principal no longer lived on campus. This became the registrar's office eventually. The registrar and assistant registrar had offices on the ground floor and accommodation for visiting dignitaries like Mr. Moyle, for example, was provided on the second and third floors. And now we will move to the building at the heart of operations of the Ontario Fire College. The Fire Technology Building opened in 1967. Originally, this building housed four apparatus bays and the maintenance mechanics office as well. For those of you who knew Lauren McNeese, that was the position that he held, basically a fleet manager. The photograph on the left shows the four apparatus bays, the rest of the tech building stretching up behind it as well to the right. The fire tech building held all the administration offices, principal, academic manager, finance, registration before it moved to the old principal's house, all the secretarial staff and um, so on. It held the print shop. It held one classroom built in the style of an amphitheater and the fire engineer's office or lab. If you knew Don Bryan, he was the first on-site engineer who retired in 1989 and was replaced by Meg McNeil as fire engineer, responsible for fire investigations into fatal fires conducted through fire scene reconstructions and fire test burns. But in 2004-05, the fire college experienced major renovations and additions. In the photo on the right, you can see that the four bay doors have become four sets of windows, floor to ceiling. Those windows are of the new and very modern classroom. Here's that aerial view again, and I've circled the whole new section at it in 2005. The classroom in the front where the apparatus bays used to be, and a new library behind that large square at the back. On the left is the new, in the photograph on the, on the right, is the new entrance atrium with a reception area and a rear service and delivery entrance behind. The doors that you can see just uh, lit up there um, on the left in that second photo um, are the doors going into the new library or resource center. Boxes are piled in front to indicate that in fact, the Ontario Fire College really is moving out. In this picture, the original classroom on the left, that amphitheater is shown. This classroom held approximately 40 students comfortably, although you could make it a few more if you tried. On the right, you will see the new, very large classroom that would easily accommodate 150 student officers with a movable sliding wall to divide the classroom into two large spaces. It was technology rich too, I should add. The classrooms can come in many different shapes and sizes. At the college, a number of demonstration labs for fire prevention courses were created. Here you can see an alarm systems lab with multiple types of systems available for hands-on demonstrations. These alarms would be used in a wide variety of types of occupancies, high-rise buildings, industrial occupancies, and so on. They gave officers from all sizes of departments an opportunity to learn about various types of systems that might suddenly appear in new occupancies being built in their own jurisdictions. These demonstration labs provided hands-on experience with industrial commercial kitchens and their suppression systems as shown on the left and another lab showing fire suppression systems of many types on the right. Here again, two more labs with extinguishing and suppression demonstration capabilities. All of these labs were used for the training of fire prevention officers, the people who would enforce building and fire code legislation and would investigate fires from the point of view of the building envelope itself. But now for a moment, we'll move to the fire suppression side of department operations. This is a very different type of classroom and a very different type of lab again, this time for fire command officers learning how to organize resources for response to a fire or other type of emergency. On the left, you can see what is called a tabletop exercise. And you may have heard various officials on television during a disaster or a potential terrorist incident or a major fire comment on their preparations for such events using tabletop exercises. In Washington, DC in January of this year, during the occupation of the Capitol building, officers of various responding agencies commented on their use of tabletop exercises to prepare for what was possibly to come. The model buildings, roadways, rail lines, apparatus could all be moved around and constantly reconfigured to create incidents of increasing complexity. 
Various colors of smoke could be added to show the presence of various types of chemicals. Trains could be shown to be crossing rail lines just at the moment when apparatus were attempting to respond. Vulnerable exposures like hospitals, nursing homes, and schools could be added to the planning. The scene could be set in a small rural village or a major downtown Toronto thoroughfare. The scene was filmed from various vantage points using closed circuit TV. The commanding officer would be located in another room and would have the limited perspective based on what he could see had he been really standing on the on ground. He must position apparatus and manpower for maximum effect, being always aware of water supply. Where are those darn hydrants? Exposures, possible presence of victims and chemicals, and his response would be critiqued then by the rest of the class. These photographs take us back to traditional, the two traditional classrooms, simply to reinforce again the capabilities that the Ontario Fire College had to train very large or medium-sized groups of fire officers. But there were other classrooms too. A quick version from the fire tech building for a moment. We can also see three portable buildings here. Actually, you can only see two in this picture. Um, but there were three portable buildings which provided classroom space for officers dealing with codes and standards. In these classrooms, fire prevention officers would be able to spread out those massive volumes of building codes, fire codes, electrical codes, and all the standards for all types of equipment. Codes and standards would be examined and referenced to explain provisions, to reinforce familiarity with the legislation itself, and as well to highlight changes being made to that legislation. These classes would usually be held to 20 to 24 students at a time, as each student would need at least a half a table to spread out her resources. Now let's talk about my world for a moment. Welcome to the Ontario Fire College Resource Centre or Library. When I was contacted in late 1989 to see whether or not I'd be interested in beginning a library at the college, I was told, as I mentioned before, that it would only be a few hours a week with a few books and a few journals. I had no idea that the next 20 years would be dominated by a whole new language and a whole new set of experiences. I loved every minute of it, and working with the fire service was more rewarding and pleasurable than anyone could ever imagine. I began in that little portable that you see in the top left, brought from Muskoka Centre. It had been sitting empty there. By 1995, I had long outgrown that portable, and so our carpentry staff added a walkway and joined on a second double wide portable building, which you can see in profile, and then again from the back. Classes would be sent to the library to work on assignments using our resources, but only the first 15 or so who got in the door would get places to sit at a table the rest would be sitting on the floor or standing leaning on fire cabinets. As our collection of books, documents, and files continued to grow, we quickly outgrew this space as well. So in 2005, when all that other construction was going on, one of the main pieces to be added to the Fire College Tech Building was a new library. And by now, I was part of a staff of two full-time librarians. These are photographs of the resource center that I took in 2006. Between the sets of stacks were tables and chairs for group work. A computer lab had been installed along one wall. For the first time, library staff had offices, and now there were two and a half of us. We had subscriptions to about 100 journals. The library held at least 800, eh, sorry, 8,000 monographs or titles. Classes could be sent to the library to work in chairs at tables. And at this point, the resource center would be open from 7.30 in the morning to eight o'clock at night, Monday through Thursday until four o'clock on Fridays. These photographs were taken in February of this year at the very end of the month, when I received permission from the principal to come to the college with Barry Brock, my right-hand man at Gravenhurst Archives, to photograph everything we could at the college before it was closed. In the photograph at the right, you can see that framed photographs and class sets are being brought to the library for packing. The photograph on the right shows that movable shelving has replaced the original 2005 stacks in the decade following my retirement in 2009, so that the entire Fire Sciences Library from the Office of the Fire Marshal in Toronto could be brought to the Resource Centre. Doesn't sound like a college that in fact was going to be closed, does it? These photographs tell the story. Tables and chairs are missing. 
boxes are piled in front of my office and the move is on and you can see things are wrapped in plastic, um, chairs are missing, tables are missing and so on. The move is definitely on. Now for something completely different. We began the previous part of this tour with an aerial view of the college buildings at street level of the Ontario Fire College. Now I would like to introduce you to the lower level of the Ontario Fire College property, the part that most people have probably thought was the only focus of college programs, although hopefully I've dispelled that myth. Again, I've labeled the buildings that you can see in the aerial photograph. You can see where we were just moments ago, where the residence building is and the fire tech building up at the very top left. And now we're going to begin with a to our tour of, of the bottom part of the, of the property at about a third of the way down the hill towards the fire ground. In 2004-05, as part of the complete renovation of the property, a road was built through a rock cut, as you can see on the left. A new fire hall was built, the other having been replaced by classrooms. This new fire hall with five apparatus bays, a classroom and an office, also required a new roadway to build down to the fire ground. So major work was done over a two year period to make all of this a reality. Here fire officers seconded from fire departments across Ontario, along with fire college instructors, prepared students for the scenarios that they would encounter on the fire ground. Captains would receive assignments and platoons could be created for each captain. Determinations were made about the type of fire to be constructed. Decisions would be made about whether or not to have victims inside the buildings using a rescue Andy. Possible issues could be discussed like type of construction, features of the building, for example, does the garage have a door into the house? Fire personnel would don their turnout gear, check their SCBA, and then apparatus would be dispatched to the fire ground. So let's go to the fire ground now. The photo on the left shows the burn tower or high rise burn building with a suburban split level house just behind it. The second photo shows that house with fire ramping up inside to push smoke through the windows. Here firefighters would practice various skills under the direction of a fire ground commander or company officer and a fire safety officer who would engage rapid intervention teams, rehab officers and so on in the reconstruction of various levels of operations. Following each fire and response, teams would debrief before beginning the next exercises. At the end of the day, all apparatus and teams would go back to the fire hall. All apparatus would be washed, equipment cleaned, SCBA or self-contained breathing apparatus would be checked, cylinders filled and everything put away. Then off to the showers for everyone and then food. Besides the burn buildings, there are a number of other buildings, large and small on this level of the property. Some for storage, but some for very important work indeed. I won't bother with the storage buildings or other small buildings like the fitness center or the rail cars or all the other things other than the ones I'm going to show you now. The top left, flashover unit, one of several that used to circulate throughout the province of Ontario to provide training to fire departments. Flashover is a phenomenon that I can explain if, somebody wish, if someone wishes to ask about it at the end of the tour. On the top right is a very important building, the fire research building. Here the fire engineer will reconstruct fire scenes with the help of our resident carpenter, painter, plumber and electrician. A fatal fire would be reconstructed in this building using materials and setup identical to the original fatal fire scene. Using thermal couples, thermal, thermal imaging cameras, etc., the fire would once again rage through a hospital room or a jail cell or a small shop to reconstruct that fatal scene. The engineer would then be able to watch and record and study all the elements that had contributed to the fire and make recommendations in her report regarding standards for building materials, paint and bedding. Below left, you can see firefighters debriefing after fire operations. On the right, you can see what so many cottagers saw as they passed in their boats, firefighters practicing raising fire streams years ago. And now we're going to move away from the fire ground to other parts of the property. Halfway back up the hill, we will stop for a moment at the Firefighters Memorial, erected by the Provincial Firefighters Association in 1988 and dedicated by Lieutenant Governor Lincoln Alexander. Each October, a service was held here and in Toronto and in other centres where such memorials have been erected. 
we did not stop at this little building on our on our upper level or level tour. This building was also from the sanatorium age, the former doctor's offices building. This became staff house or the instructor's house with offices for 10 instructors. Museum building, as it is as it so briefly was, existed up and behind the memorial in the new fire hall. It was built in 1987 and various citizens were contacted by Fred Collins, our chief instructor at the time, to conduct tours of that building. But it very quickly became a storage building for equipment and then following 9-11, it became the location for a mobile hospital unit and other disaster equipment. To the right are photographs of the OPP units who are based on our property. They built a canine training center on the property of the Ontario Fire College. In addition to an office building, which they enlarged in 2010, they also built a large number of props and jumps for their dogs, and finally a Quonset hut. They also used the property of the Muskoka Regional Center for dog training and people who lived in Gravenhurst regularly saw them on our streets. At the bottom, you can see a fleet of OPP Marine vessels used in their Marine training program. They ate meals at the college, but were mainly on the water during the day and usually went home at night. I've saved the best for the last, the pièce de résistance, Scott Hall, once called Massey Hall. Scott Hall is one of the loveliest buildings, if not the loveliest in Bravenhurst. It was built in 1913-14 by local carpenters and stonemasons with funds provided by the Chester Massey family. Massey had lost a brother to consumption. He and his family became heavily invested in the welfare of TB victims, giving generously to the buildings, building of the sanatoriums, endowing beds, and then building Massey Hall, named for his family. Massey intended the building to be used for religious services and for quiet rec recreational activities. It had a projection room where first run movies provided by city companies in the 1930s would be projected onto a screen on the stage uh, for patients of the sand. In 1962, the building was renamed Scott Memorial Hall, or simply Scott Hall, in honor of W.J. Scott, the fire marshal of Ontario who had been the driving force behind the establishment of a fire college. Scott died in 1960 while packing to leave for a NATO conference on civil defense to which he was a Canadian delegate. The photo on the right shows the main entrance, seemingly at the back of the building, as it looks today. So those photos were taken uh, just about six or seven weeks ago. The ceiling, like a ship's hull, is very like several ceilings and buildings in Gravenhurst, for example, St. James Anglican Church, an appropriate feature in a building on Lake Muskoka in a shipbuilding town. Very few features of Scott Hall have been changed over the years. One of those changes is shown in the photograph on the left. Braces were designed in sympathy with the original installed beams to provide additional support for the roof. Notice the proscenium arch over the stage as well in that photo. The central photo, center photo simply gives a sense of the floor to ceiling windows, which opened wide on both sides of the building to admit fresh air to tubercular patients. The fireplace on the right with the beautiful woodwork surrounding it features a photograph of W.J. Scott and the dedication plaque honoring him. This is simply a blow up of the plaque so you can take a closer look at it. The inscription details all the positions that he held in national and international fire service organizations, as well as his NATO membership. In this photograph, you get a sense of the whole room looking towards the back. The dark rectangle above the woodwork is actually that projection room used during sand days to project those first run movies. This photograph was taken during a Municipal Heritage Committee event, doors open 2016. During the three hours we were allotted to have Scott Hall open for display, over 100 people toured the building. The display on the left showcased the sanatorium history of the property and on the right, the new life of the property as an Ontario Fire College. That's Hank Smith in the middle if you, uh, living in town and know him, and on the right, me, waving my arm in the air to show where something probably once stood. Historical artifacts, once briefly housed in the museum, were removed to the main hallways of the Fire Technology Building and encased in all sorts of those um, beautiful cabinetry 
um, items that were actually built here on the on the property. This photograph was taken in 2018 and shows just one of the many hundreds and hundreds of graduating classes of fire officers who have just completed a program of study. This is clearly a broad representation of ranks, ages, and fire departments in this class, and that was always the case. For a number of years, thousands of students a year were enrolled in various stages of the fire officer development programs at the Ontario Fire College. The Ontario Fire College was always meant to be an officer training college. Firefighter training was always meant to be conducted in regional schools or in fire departments. And keep that in mind when reading in the newspapers how nothing will be changed by having regional training centers. Why on earth was the Ontario Fire College closed? Let's take a look first at the role of provincial government. There are two police colleges and one correctional services college still operating in the province. How can that be when they close the Ontario Fire College? Is it the dollar value of the OC property? The Ontario government has a history of privatization, nursing homes, registry offices, highway maintenance, and so on. But there's also another very strong force to reckon with the power of the OPP and the power of public perception of safety. Everyone is afraid of a crime, but no one ever expects a fire. And after all, according to Norm Miller, everything is on the internet, so they can learn at home, can't they? How many fire victims though have said afterwards, wrapped in blankets and being comforted by the firefighters who rescued them, I never thought it would happen to me. Let's take a look at the role of stakeholders, the ones who supposedly supported this decision. The Office of the Fire Marshal, after all, reports to the Solicitor General, who in turn reports to the Premier, who doesn't like his ministers to disagree with him. Stakeholders were in fact not really consulted about closing the OFC. They were asked, whether they supported modernization and regionalization of fire service training for firefighters. But the OFC, the Ontario Fire College, developed officers. The fire service was not told that modernization would mean closing the Ontario Fire College with an end to officer training. The Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs, large urban fire departments dominate that, and they can afford the cost of regional centers. The same is true of the Ontario Professional Firefighters Association or the union. They are dominated by large urban fire departments. So what about all these regional training centers that we've heard about? For example, what is going to be located in Huntsville Fire Department um, in Port Sydney? It has already all that it probably needs, they say. It has a burn building for firefighter training it has a little apparatus for roof ventilation training. That's how to ventilate a roof. You can actually make anything like it in a high school shop. And it has space for auto extrication as well. There are presently 20 regional training centers in various stages of development. The fire marshal says 20 RTCs are just the beginning and he'd be happy to see 220. And that's a direct quote. But where will they be and when? Who will build them and at what cost? To whom will that cost uh, be given? And who will profit by them? And what will they charge? Some departments believe that it may cost anywhere from $300 up to $1,200 per firefighter per course to go to an RTC. But that's for firefighting, that's recruit training. What about officer training? So essential to safe operations inspections of hazardous occupancies, and fire investigations. Never mind, on March the 31st, 2021, the Ontario Fire College closed. Gates have been installed. I must tell you that Fire Marshal W.J. Scott would not be pleased. Many people, in fact, great numbers of them are not pleased. 
we will have to hope that we do not have several large disastrous fires in the coming months and years in nursing homes, in hospitals, in schools, in apartment buildings or factories, or what will we do then? Thank you. Now, we're gonna be open for questions at this point. Um, and so if you will give your question to the moderator, that question will be forwarded to me and I will attempt to answer it. <laughs> I thought somebody might just ask that. Okay, I'm going to do my best. And if Mr. Moyle is still watching or listening, I'll be, I'll be certainly happy if he wants to leap in and say, no, no, no. <laughs> Flashover is, is a phenomenon that happens in, I'll, I'll use a room, happens in a room when everything in the room becomes so superheated to the same temperature that literally everything ignites. At that particular moment, fire flashes through the room over the tops of, of everything and heads for the nearest escape point. The flashover unit um, had a vent at the top of it where firefighters, um, well, firefighters sat on a, on a lower level platform in the flashover unit and fire was constructed at the other end of the, of the railroad car. That fire would then reach that very, very high temperature and would flash over the heads of fire um, officers sitting there in that flashover unit. Once you've seen it once or experienced it once, I suspect no firefighter would ever um, forget it. And it's a way of actually trading them with what might possibly happen in superheated circumstances. Any other questions? Is Scott Hall at a historically designated building? Well, there's a really good question. And it's a bit of a, of a mixed bag, really. I've been doing a lot of research into this. In fact, there is a document that says that it was in fact designated historically by the Ontario government uh, back probably at about 1989 or so. But I have not yet found the actual documentation for that. And although I've appealed to the various um, ministries and so on that look after heritage, buildings in this province, they have not yet been able quite to come up with the document that says so. What we plan to do in Gravenhurst is municipally designate the building so that it will have that level of protection to start with. And we're hoping that it also has provincial um, protection as well under the Ontario Heritage Act. <laughs> oh, I love it. Was, was Scott Hall's basement once used as a morgue, she says. I'm sure she's thinking about, or the person is thinking about, the time when a fire um, raged through the property of the Muskoka Free Hospital for Consumptives in 1920. That fire destroyed some of the main buildings on the property and, and people were rushed around from here to there, but no one died in the fire. So in fact, it wouldn't have been at that particular time. I have not heard of any kind of conclusive <laughs> evidence that the basement was used as a morgue. Yes, I do know where the Ontario Fire College Resource Centre materials have gone. The entire Ontario Fire College Resource Centre materials have gone to the University of Toronto. Wonderful to know that um, the books and monographs and so on have been protected. Not so wonderful to think about how firefighters are going to in any way make any use of those materials if in fact they do not happen to be alumni of the University of Toronto, but I'm sure someone will work that out for us. Um, I don't know what happened to all the filing cabinets of materials that I had in there, articles and, and reports, documents. Um, I don't know as well what happened to an entire fire 
um, filing cabinet full of photographs that have been taken by Lauren McNeese from the beginning of his tenure there to the end. He was our, our regular photographer of every event. And I fear and believe that those all went to the dump. Yes, the Ontario Fire College at one time did help to fight a local fire. Um, we weren't allowed to do so uh, very quickly because there were all kinds of issues about um, liability and so on. But do people, if people remember the family ties fire that occurred here on Hotchkiss Street, I don't know if, how many people will remember that. I think it was Hotchkiss, I'm trying to think now exactly of the street. Um, but anyway, it was a little restaurant that was there and it, it was a fatal fire. And I do believe that we um, sent an apparatus to that fire. It was maybe back in the 19, early 1990s. As well, fire um, college um, instructors went to help with that massive tire fire that occurred um, in Southern Ontario. Um, at the turn of the 21st century. Um, but we were eventually told that we could no longer um, assist in fires and we could not have any of our personnel be members of fire departments because of liability issues. This presentation was in fact recorded. Um, as I spoke, and it is going to be uh, shown on the library website, um, and it will be using, um, um, we're going to put it on YouTube, yeah, so it's going to be on YouTube. Uh, we will be posting a mess, <clears throat> excuse me, I am going to lose my voice, I can tell. Um, we will be posting a message on the uh, library uh, board telling um, everyone where to get that Zoom connection. If people have questions that they would like to ask me as well, and would prefer perhaps not to make public, um, I am going to be um, asking our resident technician over here to uh, post my um, email address and my phone number, um, because I use those for archives as well, since with uh, COVID we're not able to uh, to interact with people here in the archives. Um, I will be posting those or Megan will be posting those, those for me. And you're welcome to contact me at home. Um, it's where I operate the archives right now. So um, I have a special chair and table where um, the archives lives at this particular moment. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's Andrew Hind asking that question. I noticed that Andrew Hind has a new book out now and on the cover of the book is a picture of the Ontario Fire College or of Scott Hall. And in fact, in that book, uh, he, I think, um, is showing all kinds of um, uh, ghostly presences in, in Ontario any or in Gravenhurst. Anyway, no, I have I have done little or no research whatsoever on ghostly apparitions at the Ontario Fire College. Um, that's my fault. I'm I'm pretty much a realist and pretty much a, a hardcore evidence based person. So I probably don't have the imagination necessary to, to deal with ghostly presences. I had so much research to do for fire departments and fire services over my 20 years that I really didn't have time for ghosts. All those real, all those real guys were, <laughs> were too busy asking questions. Oh, no, I do not have a list and I've never seen a list of all the people who worked at the Ontario Fire College. For instance, I'm thinking of Smitty, people who knew who knew um, Smitty um, and was one of the very first uh, people to work at the Ontario Fire College. I'm sure that there are people who are wishing that that they had a list of all the people who worked with him, for example, like Mr. Leonard and there are other people like that. And the list would be a long one. Um, 
it's something certainly that I could begin to put together um, once I can get back into the archives again when COVID has died down a bit uh, through newspapers and, and, uh, and through my collection of materials that I have personally on the Ontario Fire College, but I've not done so. All the questions, and maybe you can see the lightning that's vibrating in the <laughs> in the windows behind me. Oh, there's a question from Julia here. Yes. Yeah, I, I've got a question that came up. It, it came to me privately, but I think it's um, worthwhile mentioning because then you can answer it for everyone. Um, uh, this person's curious about the firefighters memorial um, and if it's going to still be accessible to the public in the future. That is a really good question about the Firefighters Memorial and what's going to happen to it and will it be accessible in the future. From what I understand, the Firefighters Memorial, there will be no attempt to move it for a starter. So that's probably, I, I guess that's good news. At the same time, whatever happens to this property will determine what happens to the memorial in terms of its accessibility. Gates are going to be closed. They're already in place. They've been installed just recently. And those gates will close and you will not be able to go on the property. Security is still there. And they've already stopped the mayor of Gravenhurst who attempted to go on the property about a week ago, asked him what he was doing and, and uh, asked him if he wouldn't mind leaving, please. Um, it is not a public property in any sense. Um, I don't honestly know because we have no idea what's going to happen to uh, that property. I'm assuming that it is the intention of the premier to have it sold as soon as possible and uh, to get as, as many bucks for it as he can. And who knows what kind of, of um, what kind of an occupancy it will be that takes over the Ontario Fire College property. I can't even imagine. But right now I feel very sad that people will not be able to get near that firefighters memorial once those gates close. And actually even now they won't be able to go there. Anything else before we close? Um, Christopher Pape mentioned um, that a request has been made to have a faculty and staff alumni day at the OFC in the future. Um, just so you're aware of that, Judy, that popped up. That um, sounds wonderful. I would be so excited if I had an opportunity to see um, some of the faculty and staff that I worked with. I hope that invitation would include uh, Mr. Bernard Moyle, the Fire Marshal of Ontario, under whom I worked most of my career, and his wife, Karen Booth Moyle, who was very heavily involved in the uh, modernization of the curriculum at the Ontario Fire College and, and officer training um, and, and any of the other people who were, were connected with, uh, with the fire college. That would be lovely. Yeah, it certainly would They'd be very fitting, I think. Absolutely. Um, it might provide me at least, and I bet for some others with a sense of closure. Exactly. Yes. If that has to be accepted, right? So for sure. I think, um, I think those buildings at this point are empty. It, I can't prove that. I don't know that. I haven't been on the property. But when I was last there, I was told that everything would be gone by the 31st of March. Any other questions before we close? Uh, there's looks like there's just one. I know. Um, so somebody was asking, um, given COVID, uh, this person was told that a, um, a video was being considered a, a decommissioning event. Have you heard anything about that at all? Jean? I've heard nothing about a decommissioning event of any kind. No. Okay. That would cost okay. money. <laughs> right. <laughs> Excuse okay, my cynicism. Well, um, I oh, know. Understandable. Um, it, it, yeah, we had some amazing comments and compliments, Judy, um, in the chat. Um, I'm hoping we can capture all of those as well. Um, so that you can see them, because I know you haven't been, you haven't necessarily been able to look at them. No, I haven't <laughs> seen them. <laughs> um, just uh, wanted to thank Judy very much for preparing this presentation and for her willingness um, to do this. She was really the instigator on, on this, <laughs> asking if we would partner with her. Um, uh, many of you probably are aware that Judy um, has done great uh, local history talks for us or here at well, for Gravenhurst uh, here at the library in person um, and uh, and this is our first local history talk to be done virtually and we're, we're looking at doing others with Judy in partnership with Judy um, 
and, and maybe repeating some of the ones she's done for us uh, in person too. So please keep an eye open for those. Um, and, and just so you're aware, we will be sending out the link to um, the video once we've got it pre prepared, once it's recorded and up and, and uh, available for people. Uh, we are going to be sending that information out to all of you um, and your emails. So, um, so just to make it a little easier for you to find it on our website. So yeah, so that's, that's, I think that's everything. I want to thank Judy and I want to thank Megan Davidson as well for being our, our technical yes. expert on, uh, on keep bringing everybody into the conversation or everybody into the, um, the event. And I think it went pretty well. <laughs> you know, we, we have a bit of a thunderstorm going on in the background. As a, we as have a, a magical <laughs> lightning show outside. So. <laughs> So luckily power hasn't gone off yet. So we'll get this recording um, looked after and, and uh, get that information out to everybody as well. So good night, everyone. And thank you for tuning in. Good night, everyone. Thanks again. Take care.